good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jens Chapman. It's with a great deal of sadness, uh, but it's also a great honor for me uh, to welcome you all here to the special commemorative Grand Rounds for Dr. Bill Mills, uh, beloved partner, resident, attending, colleague, friend to so many of us. I know he'd be very proud and appreciative of all of you being here together, but he'd quite clearly not want to make a fuss about himself. And I'm quite certain that he'd not approve of us congregating about him here today, but he'd love for all of us to be together. The reason why it's so special to talk about Bill is very clear. He was with us for 11 years, 11 short, 11 wonderful years. He was a resident with us for five years and an attending for six years. And he uh, embodied what is uh, just really the ideal doctor, physician, and friend. He was an incredibly hardworking, determined man. He was a very skilled surgeon, and he always had a smile on his face uh, for reasons that are just uh, really um, uh, uh, reflective in his very genuine background, his upbringing in uh, Alaska, which uh, made him a very tough, a very determined man. It is maybe not well known, he did, never bragged about this, but he survived uh, six foot seas and more than any recorded uh, time, over seven minutes in the Bering Sea before the TV show Deadly Catch became so common. He was um, uh, always present and just a very, very positive inspiration for all of those around him. And as I'm looking around at the many residents who never saw him, it is my hope and our hope here that maybe the tremendous inspirational quality of this man will somehow be passed on and this would then do him uh, justice. I welcome uh, a lot of you here who've uh, been with us in the past. I particularly want to point out that we're uh, very um, proud to have and very honored to have uh, family members here. His sister Martha and his brother Matt are in the front row. And so many co-residents and alumni have come here and taken trips from far away. I'm not going to name you all, but it's really uh, very special to have you here this morning. So thank you all for taking the time and the effort to come together in this sad but special morning. Uh, with this, I'd like to introduce you to our associate professor, Dr. Daphne Beingessner. She's going to start off the morning by playing a song titled A Hundred Years. And the special meaning for this song is that um, Bill's daughter, Isabel, played this in front of over 1,300 people in Alaska during the funeral services. Uh, Isabel is 16 years, and um, she did a marvelous job in front of everybody. And Daphne, why don't you take us from here?
Thank you, Daphne. That was very beautiful. Next, I'm going to ask Dr. Eli Powell uh, to step up to the podium. Um, Dr. Powell is a graduate of 1993 and served as senior resident for Bill. And he's going to reflect a little bit about what it uh, was that made him so unique as a resident and as a friend. So I, first I wanted to thank Jens and all the faculty and friends at Harborview for inviting myself and my wife uh, Judy back uh, this morning. I want to thank uh, Matt and Martha for allowing me to speak. Uh, this is a special place for us. It's uh, uh, where we met uh, and, and where I spent my formative years as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, we were speaking about this last night with uh, Dr. Rout and Dr. Chapman, but when you're a second year resident intern here and you're uh, doing all the uh, hard things you do and you're just trying to get through the next day and get through your 24, 48, 72 hours of call, uh, you don't realize that the people that you're spending this time with are become the most important people in your life. It's the uh, times like this, the difficult times uh, speaking to the residents that really are your uh, formative years. And when you're going through it, sometimes you don't realize it. But those of us that are years out, these are the people that are special to us, uh, whether it's your faculty or professors or whether you're fellow residents. And, and, and that's what, uh, those are the frames around which you uh, structure, which you build your lives. So um, just want you guys to realize it because sometimes we don't. And, and, and now I'm here speaking about uh, one of my best uh, friends. I'm gonna talk about what, what, what I learned from Bill Mills uh, as a resident and uh, throughout life. I first met Bill over 20 years ago when I was Bill's uh, chief resident. And th through the next 20 years, uh, Bill taught me a lot of things. Um, one of the things he, uh, he taught me was that when you're a junior resident and you know more than your faculty <laughs> or your uh, chief resident, he taught me how to be humble and modest because Bill was one of those uh, second year residents that showed up here knowing a lot more about life and orthopedics uh, than a lot of us did. Uh, the second thing Bill taught me was how to be an expert. He was an expert physician and surgeon. I'm up in Anchorage now uh, where I practice uh, orthopedics and uh, arrived there after a long career in the, uh, in the military and uh, spending time in the wars in uh, Iraq and uh, got up there and Bill was uh, universally acknowledged as the best all-around surgeon, all-around orthopedic surgeon, one of the best people in the state of Alaska and he'll, he'll be sorely missed. The third thing I learned about from Bill Mills is that it's possible to get through a second year of residency wearing nothing but a jean jacket and a pair of scrubs. <laughs> um, I'm not making that up. I don't think I saw Bill the, old, the whole second year of residency as his chief showing up in anything but a jean jacket and a uh, pair of scrubs. At that time I thought he was from Alaska. I'd never been to Alaska. I thought that was all Alaskans uh, wore. Uh, since then I know they wear Carhartts too. But, uh, <laughs> the fourth thing, uh, Bill taught me how to be a fantastic husband and father. Um, we became very close over the last uh, five years, and nothing was uh, more important to him than his uh, brothers, his sisters, his mother, his father, his wife, Carrie, his uh, uh, children, Isaiah, Jackson, Isabella, Tyler, and Emily. And even though Bill, Bill was the only trauma, really the only trauma surgeon up in Alaska, and as a, I, I sent a pelvis fracture down here, oh, I talked to Daphne, and then I talked to Chip about six months ago, and a lady that had an open book pelvis fracture, and I hadn't talked to Chip in a while, and he told me, you know, the uh, siphon's been shut off since Bill Mills arrived up in, uh, in Alaska. But Bill was a unique trauma surgeon. The rest of us are on call uh, in the community uh, trauma call four to five times a month. Bill was on 24-7, 30 days a month, and will be uh, his, his mad skill. As my kids called his skills, his mad skills will be, uh, will be sorely missed. The fifth thing that I learned... Um, from Bill Mills was what it was to be a, a great friend and to uh, welcome uh, all of us to the community up there. It was uh, Christmas, just this past Christmas Eve, and uh, Bill and Carrie invited uh, Judy and I and our children over to his house um, on Christmas Eve to be part of their family as our family is uh, far away. Uh, I have a teenage, we have a teenage daughter now who's uh, 16 years old, and I, I got the the standard, it's going to be boring, I won't know anybody, this is going to stink, I don't want to go, I want to stay home and do Facebook. Those of you that are parents uh, know what I mean. So we arrived there and uh, their uh, family was very welcoming. She had a tremendous time and uh, on the way out she told me, Dad, we have to do this uh, every year because four Jewish people never had a better time on Christmas <laughs> Eve. Than <anybody> else. <laughs> 
And this is something that you all, um, is uh, near and dear to your hearts and something I don't have to t stand up here and tell you about, but the last thing Bill, one of the last things Bill taught me was what it is like to be a really good teacher. Um, my son is, uh, our son is an 18 year old uh, senior. He's uh, interested in uh, medicine and did his uh, high school mentorship where he spent uh, four months with, uh, with Bill uh, in the operating room. Um, when it came time to write his college essay on the person that made a significant impact on his life and the best teacher he ever had, uh, he picked uh, Bill. So um, as I went home and told my son after I found out he wrote his essay that I spent 18 years with him, Bill spent four months. He writes his essay about Bill and he's paying for his own college education. <laughs> so uh, we have an Alaska State Orthopedic Conference every year in Alaska. Many of the faculty here have been invited to uh, join. Um, and we renamed the conference uh, this year the uh, William J. Mills III uh, All-Alaskan Orthopedic Conference because of the contributions uh, Bill made not only to orthopedics but to all the musculoskeletal care of all patients in the Northwest. And this was a, a special time for us and this is a copy of the program and uh, hopefully many of you uh, will in the uh, following years come up to uh, honor the, uh, Bill's memory and all his uh, contributions. And now and I once again want to thank uh, all of you for allowing me to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the uh, personal side of Bill Mills, uh, what it was like for us to uh, spend time together as a resident and uh, what he meant to the state of Alaska and the contributions he's made to the care of patients, uh, not only in Seattle, uh, but throughout the whole North Northwest. Thank you, Jens. Thank you, Eli. And on behalf of the alumni, it's wonderful to have you and our many other alumni back. Um, next, we'll have a series of um, uh, our faculty talks, and our faculty will talk about uh, some of the tremendous contributions that Bill made uh, to the uh, research aspect of um, trauma surgery. He had a very wide coverage area in terms of his uh, topics, and uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Borrego first, I believe, and uh, he'll be followed by Doug Hanel, our program director and Chip will close out the orthopedic part of the presentations. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. My name is David Bure, uh, and I'm one of the attending orthopedic surgeons here um, at Harborview. You know, I, I came to Harborview um, to do my trauma fellowship August 1st, 1999, uh, and there were four of us uh, back then. There's myself, Bob Himes, Thomas Schildauer, and Sandy Schmidt, uh, and Bill was a member of the orthopedic blue team, the orthopedic trauma team called Blue, and at the time his colleagues were Bruce Sanjorzen and Dr. Doug Smith, and the blue team was the, uh, the last rotation of my fellowship. Uh, Bill's career interests and abilities were unique, uh, and I still think they are. He was a, a really a rare individual who truly enjoyed caring for the traumatized, multiply injured orthopedic patient, yet he had the abilities of a surgeon that lived in the world of sports medicine. And up until that point, I had never really considered uh, those two interests or areas to be terribly compatible. For the most part, they have very different injury mechanisms and patient demographics, patient and surgeon expectations and ideal treatments. Uh, and Bill was able to make all of that work. I think very few have really ever been able to do so. At the time, in my mind, there was really only one person that had transcended the world successfully of taking care of a high energy, multiply injured trauma patient and also mastered the techniques of arthroscopy and sports medicine, and that was Bill Mills. He had a keen eye for subtle injuries around the knee, and that's really where he made his home. His ability to deal with the soft tissue and osseous injuries of the knee was remarkable and his surgical and non-surgical managements of very complicated knee injuries were logical, technically skilled and adept and were considerate of all the other uh, concomitant problems that the patient had, and like reimplanting a 13 centimeter extruded segment of femur back into a 15 year old boy, not because that was the perfect solution but because all the other options were even worse. Bill's own was dislocations and fracture dislocations of the knee and he sought out the snakes in the grass and that these particular injuries have and he studied them, he learned them and then he turned around and taught us about them. His work on heterotopic ossification after knee dislocations has helped guide the management of these complex injuries and the multiply injured patient, a combination not really previously described or much even discussed. And distal femoral traction pins on the same side 
as multi-ligamentous knee injuries were particularly troublesome for Bill, and that's when he and Chip really got into it. Bill's work on the utilization of the ABI for knee dislocation was nothing short of fantastic, and it hammered home the idea that the ABI was really merely an extension of the physical examination, and if you told Bill about a knee dislocation and didn't tell him about an ABI, you might as well have not even done your physical examination. And finally, he helped me start to scratch the surface of the high-energy proximal tibia fracture, and for that, I'm very indebted to him. You know, Bill had a presence. And uh, while we all knew to watch out for Dr. Rout's bark, uh, we all really watched out for Dr. Mills's bite. <laughs> and he had a masterful Socratic presence in Fracture Conference that challenged all of us, whether you were a medical student or whether you were the attending surgeon whose x-rays were being scrutinized at that very particular point. You needed to know your facts, you needed to know your anatomy, the rationale, what was done and how did the patient do. And, I wasn't there was really not an acceptable answer for Bill. And yes, yeah, sometimes he taught with a fist. Most of the time that was open though. Um, but he taught us. And he had expectations. And he sure wouldn't lower them. You knew what cloth Bill was cut from when you listened to him talk about his patients. And he'd use the phrase, this man's a working man. And this spoke volumes of how Bill approached his patients because that was Bill. Bill was a working man. And his treatments were always with an eye to getting someone back to work, back to their jobs, back to providing, back to their family, back to their lives. Because that's what's important to our patients. And he did that with a good looking x-ray too. And as luck would have it, after my fellowship, I joined the blue team. And it was pretty much Bill and I taking care of most of the fractures on the blue team and trying to make our way through 100 to 110 patient uh, clinics on Tuesdays. And we try to drink as much coffee as we could. And we, uh, we used up pretty much all of the cuss words in the English language, a couple other languages too. Uh, and I think Carrie, his wife, uh, still blames me for encouraging Bill's use of uh, colorful language. And, and she's probably right because I, I doubt it was the stint in the Navy uh, or, or an Alaskan fishing boat in the Bering Sea that could have been responsible for that. <laughs> You know, uh, at this time, one year ago, uh, I was in Alaska at the Hotel Alaska. at Bill's request. And uh, for anyone who has been in this spot, it, it's predictably rather unnerving uh, being asked by a previous mentor to come and teach at a meeting. And but uh, to echo what Eli said, while I, I fumbled through my lectures, it became rapidly clear to me how much of a respected resource that Bill had come uh, become to the orthopedic community, you know, present in that room and present in the community of Anchorage and indeed the state of Alaska and ultimately the Pacific Northwest. And so it was apparent that the expertise that I had witnessed and had benefited from while Bill was here at Harborview was still going on. Uh, Bill taught me a lot. You know, he taught me about fractures and how to fix them. He showed me how to put on uh, my first femoral distractor, and that session came with a little bit of an edge. Uh, and I tried to skate my way around that one, but he'd have none of that, you know. Uh, and he, he taught me how to look for snakes in the grass and to learn about them, and he taught me a work ethic. And when I first thought about what Bill gave to me, my immediate and first thoughts will uh, always be the most accurate. I'll let you read that yourself. My name is Doug Hill, and uh, because of my role as uh, the director of uh, orthopedic education in this residency, I am eminently um, expert at, at Bill Mills and his record. But uh, mostly, I'd like to address the fact that before Bill Mills became Bill Mills, he was a student and um, a resident, like all of you in this room. 
He uh, received his bachelor's degree at, at Ann Arbor. He uh, went to the University of Michigan as a Vandenberg scholar. And then he pursued further education, uh, trying to find a place colder than Anchorage. <laughs> went to medical school in uh, the University of Colorado. Uh, was an AOA in his junior year. And uh, during that time, and during his uh, medical school and, and basic sciences, he uh, produced uh, his first two manuscripts, uh, one with William Jr. and uh, his dad and himself on uh, cold immersion and an, an article on the management of frostbite. He came to the University of Washington as a general surgeon and did his internship in his first year of residency before we found him or he found us. And it's not really sure how that worked, um, but uh, he definitely found us and we him. As its chief resident, he received the Viktor Frankl Award for the best scientific paper. During his residency, he subsequently published four papers um, that were published after he uh, departed, but all of which the manuscripts were managed and first uh, vetted um, as a chief resident. I'd like to address the first one just because I was a co-author with him. And it, it's a lateral approach to the humeral shaft. It's an alternative to fracture management at the time, and it appeared in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 1996, but was presented at the OTA as a poster in 1993. And, and basically, the, the, the premise of the paper is that um, despite what was written in the literature at that time, there was an alternative to um, approach to the humeral shaft. And it was an offshoot of a day when I was raising a lateral arm flap, pre-flap, for a soft tissue coverage. And Bill said, you know, we could get to the entire humerus if we use that same exposure. And it consisted of an exposure of using a lateral incision along the mid-lateral line, dissecting through an inter, in, in a plane that allowed us to get to the humerus, identify the radial nerve with relative facility, and the, the illustrations that were shown. And in this particular technique paper, he demonstrated that we actually could use this technique if we wanted. And the case that was presented was in a multiply traumatized patient who would not only had a radial nerve palsy, but was going to require his upper extremities to be weight bearing. We uh, performed this exposure, and the patient actually went on to heal, <coughs> as would be anticipated with this. The conclusions of the paper was that the approach allows supine positioning, supine positioning in a multiply traumatized patient and for the anesthesiologist in the room. And for those of you that have to deal with this, a supine positioning is monumental in the management of multiply traumatized patients. Allowed us to visualize the nerve in its entirety and required no muscle wasting or muscle splitting, decreasing the impact and the load and the energy that is required or directed by the surgeon on that particular patient. You know, it's very interesting, but this paper preceded a much more popular paper by six months in the literature by two of our friends. And the often quoted paper for this exposure is that of Gerwin and Hodgkiss. <coughs> now, as important as, as that was to Bill's and as important as it was and represents his first paper as a member of, of this group, of our orthopedic group, I, I think the thing that, that if you look at his curriculum vitae, listed as his first presentation from the podium was in 1994, in September 1994, when a bunch of young surgeons went up to Alaska with their chief resident and presented a series on orthopedic trauma he presented this particular paper. And he's particularly proud because he brought back to Alaska what he wanted to bring to Alaska. If you go through his resume and his folder as a resident, which I keep on all residents and I'm obligated to do, the evaluations of Bill as a resident um, were a series of, of symbols. This was before core competencies. And, and basically, you would get these little notes. And, and, and things were, were very common. But uh, it, it's very few times that a faculty member will refer to a resident as intimidating. <laughs> yeah, he did suffer fools lightly. And um, if you were foolish, he would be the first to let you know. He was a very, very straightforward person. 
And as I was writing this last night, um, I received an email that I will please preview and let you read. And this is from uh, Don Lowry, um, and probably epitomizes Bill for his generosity, sparkle in his smile, his Alaskan ease, but mostly his humble manner, and the great person that he was. Thank you. Chip. Good morning. It's nice to see you guys here. Um, it's really nice to see Matt and Martha, Bill's brother and sister here. And uh, Tim O'Mara is here and Julie Schweitzer from Minnesota and Scott Hormel's come. Scott was a uh, resident with Bill. Bill and I um, made, uh, I wouldn't say immediate friends, but we got along uh, really good. The first time I met him, we were in the cafeteria. Um, by the latte bar and he was hopping mad and um, I had no idea who he was but I loved his anger and uh, <laughs> it, it, it appealed to me uh, greatly and it was like a magnet and uh, he became an expert friend as far as I was from, from that moment. I loved the way he got mad about appropriate things and let you know exactly how you felt which I thought was uh, a, a really great quality. We had good times uh, working together. I really enjoyed him when he was an intern on my team. I liked him a lot when he was a resident on my team. It was always so easy to work with Bill because everything was so well managed. And uh, then it was fun to go down to Navy. He, I was sent, I was uh, sent as a missile to uh, San Diego uh, by uh, my boss at the time who said, um, yeah, I don't care what it takes, you know, get him back here. And so I went down to San Diego and I visited with Carrie and Bill at their little condo or apartment that they had over on uh, the island. And, and um, he, he asked me several questions about what it was like to be on the faculty here. And then he said, um, yeah, what about the pig farm? And uh, the pig farm was this place we used to hunt. This is Matt and Bill a long time ago uh, hunting some geese. And he said, you know, I, I really need a place to hunt and if I'm coming back to Seattle. And so I always believed that the pig farm was, uh, the Yakima pig farm was the place that really sealed it for him and was able to allow us to hold on to Bill for a while. We, uh, we co-authored uh, four uh, publications together, uh, or five publications together. Four of these were pelvic, and my focus today is on his uh, contributions to the orthopedic literature regarding pelvic fractures. And uh, we, we uh, were able to target four different journals with these uh, publications over a five-year span. And uh, the, they were all pelvic-related uh, papers and contributions and not acetabular. Um, in the mid, uh, early to mid-90s, uh, iliosacral screws were becoming very popular, as some of you may or may not know, and people were inserting these with uh, great liberty and uh, they required a little bit of a technical demand because the, the screws through the nerve root or through the facets of the lumbar spine or through the spinal canal, as you can see here, were a real problem and were, uh, it was just not a very well known technique. And so the, the first article that Bill and I published together was on iliosacral screw complications. And what the emphasis of the manuscript was is that if you understood the anatomy and you understood the osteology and you understood the imaging, didn't have to have all these problems. And one of the things Dr. Matson taught me early on in around 1989, that if you publish your complications, people will flock to those. And so Bill and I targeted this, uh, and the other co-authors targeted this population of patients. And we've, we were able to describe that posterior pelvic ring fixation using iliosacral screws was very safe and very efficient. And it was a, it's a very well-quoted article still. Um, the next was in uh, clinical orthopedics and related research. It was a symposium on pelvic fractures and the emphasis was percutaneous fixation. And that article uh, uh, used this uh, to describe all of the different injury patterns that could be treated with percutaneous fixation of the pelvis. And again, this was still a fairly new technique and uh, it was a very helpful article in describing what injuries could actually take these screws and not just how to do them. The next was in the Journal of Injury in uh, 2001, and this was uh, an article that again was emph emphatic about uh, not just fixing the posterior pelvic ring, but also addressing the anterior pelvic ring and how the contributions of the front and the back actually worked in symbiosis together to, to help uh, patients. And then, um, now this is a, <laughs> Eli mentioned, um, Eli mentioned um, 
the, the faucet, the Alaskan faucet of flow of uh, complicated patients being just slowly uh, turned off, uh, like immediately, bam, when Bill hit town. But it wasn't really turned off. There was still this squeak. And so when, whenever something came, it changed. And so whenever something came from Alaska, it was just horrible. You know, it was really <laughs> hard. And so it got to the point where, you know, Bill would call and you'd say, yeah, I, I, I don't want to talk to you. You know, what, what's coming next? And so, uh, for example, this is one of the patients that he sent down. And it was uh, the article in Orthopedic Clinics in North America dealt with a very, very high energy pelvic ring disruption and how the orthopedic surgeon and the techniques that we use uh, relate to the overall management of the patient, including the resuscitation, how we need to be, stuff Dr. Hansen taught us about the femur a long time ago, same about the pelvis. But I also got a bunch of bonus lessons uh, from Bill that kind of came passively as he just sort of lived his life. And I'll leave you with several things um, that I, I think uh, we all learned. Um, one is that um, the more you know, the less you need. And if you ever went to Bill's office, you realize that he didn't need much, you know, and most of it that he needed was on the floor. And um, it, was, it was a chaos office, and uh, it was just awesome. And uh, he would come down to my office a lot, and we sat around and drank lots of coffee. And one of the things that became clear to me when I hunted with Bill also is that he just didn't need a, a whole lot to be incredibly uh, functional. And this is Bill and Isabel with her first duck. Uh, this is at their duck shack up in uh, Susitna Flats. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Yeah. And, um, you know, Bill would get in the car to go hunt, and he would toss a duffel bag in the back. And I was telling this story last night, and um, you'd say, where are your waiters? And he'd say, they're in the bag. And you'd say, where's your shotgun? He'd go, it's in the bag. You got any ammo? It's in the bag. He'd go, oh, come on, this guy's going to be bumming shells off me. And I, I mean, everything was in, like, this bag. Every, all the rest of us had all these gear boxes and everything. Bill was incredibly efficient. He just didn't need a whole lot because he knew a whole lot. Uh, same with putting out decoys or anything. He just knew where to set up and knew what was going on. A couple of weeks ago, I told a story where um, I teased Bill one day when we were dove hunting over in Yakima, and uh, neither one of us was doing much good, but I, I teased him, and I said, you know, if you shot a little better, you'd probably be a pretty good Texan, and he just sort of went, huh, you know, like, you know, heck with you, buddy, you know, and didn't say much, as you know, and so a couple of months later, we were hunting in Alaska, and I was slogging through this mud flats, and I couldn't hardly walk, and my knee was hurting, and I was just putting it in the mud, and he looked at me, he said, you know, I might have not made a very good Texan, but you make a really crappy Alaskan. <laughs> and uh, he said, why don't you quit whining and just hunt? And it was like, <laughs> so I learned that uh, from Bill. And then I think also, I think uh, if you had to find the poster child for well done beats well said, it was Bill. You know, he just didn't talk a whole lot about what he did. He just sort of did it. And he's got these landmark articles that sort of stand, and they're still always quoted at every trauma meeting you go to. And he just sort of did it, and there wasn't a bunch of fanfare chest thumping about it. And then the other thing is, is I think you appreciate what's around you. And I think Bill, you know, savored every moment here that he was uh, a resident, mostly. Uh, Scott, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I think that he savored every moment that he was hunting or fishing or whatever he was doing. And I think it's the reason he has home was always so open. We, we, you know, the residents here lost a great mentor when Bill uh, moved back to Alaska, but we also, you know, lost a great host. And uh, one of the things that uh, he was always first to do was to open his home to everyone and, and anyone. So um, it, it goes beyond just his contributions to pelvic ring injuries and to orthopedic polytrauma and to and complex knee injuries. It goes just to life lessons as well. And so uh, one of the things we learned from Bill was, uh, you know, just to, to, to live. But I think we've also learned something with his death, is, and that's to, you know, be very aware of those that are around you and the relationships that you have because they're very frail. And, um, yeah, I've, I've learned this also is that, you know, Bill goes on with all of us, and uh, he, a good man never dies. So that's, uh, that's the best I can say for you uh, today. The next uh, speaker, uh, I, I, it's always nice to introduce people that need no introduction, and so Dr. Kopis is going to share some of his thoughts uh, with Bill, about Bill uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Kopis says all of you, uh, this is like introducing Babe Ruth, uh, he hits the ball. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Good morning and thank you. Uh, 
T.S. Eliot started The Wasteland with a, a thought that April is the meanest month. And April has, uh, to a certain extent, been mean to us uh, in a variety of ways. And in, in the midnight uh, of your life, in the hours of fatigue and concern, you on occasion uh, may think, uh, how will I be thought of? Uh, how am I thought of? What is it that people think of me? And we don't think that this particular issue will live after. It's just, how am I considered? The gladiators uh, had a phrase for this. Uh, spectamur agendo. By your actions, you will be known. And I think this meeting epitomizes that. Uh, it epitomizes a sense that this hospital has had since its inception, when it was on the Tide Flats in the Duwamish. It certainly epitomizes the institution when it was King County Hospital in the 1930s and 1940s, when during the war it was supported by surgeons like Frank Matheny and other people who gave up their time and their lives to allow the Union people to be cared for. Uh, they were not allowed in other hospitals or people of color uh, to be cared for because they too were excluded. And in this institution, we gather uh, as people frequently volunteer to work here, uh, choosing to be in the downtown rather than the uptown, simply because we are allowed or have chosen to take care of the patients who come here. The patients are variously clothed, they're variously colored, they have various personalities. Uh, many of them have not succeeded that well in life, but they are patients. And they epitomize the reason to become a physician or a teacher. And that is to explore your capability to its extent and to transfer your capability to the sick. Particularly obeying, if you will, the, the great Latin phrase or at least the word of caritas. We provide both care and comfort for the city. We have, in certain instances, exploded our capabilities. Uh, there are those who were <coughs> exiled, if you will, to Harborview because of the potential of legalities. They fixed femurs and did other things that were beyond their time, and now the rest of the world follows them. There are people who have <coughs> learned to resuscitate the dead, and certainly the world looks with interest on that particular activity. But more importantly, the hospital has taught the community that it is important to care for others. And when you think about this incredibly gifted collection of people in this room today, they pay tribute to a man who epitomized the ability to share himself with all who needed him. No matter where he was, no matter what he was doing, he gave of himself unselfishly, knowingly, he probably sacrificed much of the relationships with his family that he might otherwise have enjoyed to do the things that have flashed in front of you. To become, if you will, a known scholar is immaterial. It is more important that the people he took care of did well. And it's important for all of us, I think, to profess to his immortality. And his immortality lives on as a spirit of, I am a physician, in the spirit of his wonderful father. I am a physician and I will care. I will provide you with the best I possibly can. I will take care of you regardless of your background, your lifestyle, your habits. I will not call you vulnerable. I will call you a patient. And that's what Bill Mills did for all of us. He took care of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kopas, and thank you uh, to the attendings who spoke. Um, I think it is very safe to say that uh, we're all very privileged to have had Bill around us. He made our patients better, and he made us all better with his example. I thank all of you for coming this morning and uh, hopefully all of us will carry the spirit of Bill around us and uh, do well and take care of our business as well as we can and be proud that we get to work 
where we have a great place to be at. Thank you all.